Hi guys, welcome back. Um, today we start our first uh, cumulative style review sheet for the final next week. Uh, today is cumulative review number one. Tomorrow will be cumulative review number two. Uh, you'll get an answer key with that as well. And Monday will be cumulative review number three also. Uh, and then Tuesday is the final. That's, that's the uh, end of the road, Tuesday, Wednesday. You guys are all set for them. Um, I know I was speaking with a few of you over the last day or so uh, regarding uh, calculators. Some of you have gotten phone calls from the school about handing in all your materials for the end of the year, uh, calculators included. If you were uh, one of those that got a phone call about handing in your calculator, uh, Monday or Tuesday when you might still need it for the f uh, final exam. Uh, all you have to do is I checked my uh, math chairman and they, uh, he basically said, just call the uh, school. You can call the main office at MacArthur. Just let them know that you still have to take a pre-calc final on Tuesday into Wednesday and that you need to return your calculator after that. Uh, so they'll make arrangements for you. That's not a problem. They still have collection of materials throughout next week, even towards the end of the week. So you'd be able to just find a, an alternative time to hand in your calculator after you're done with the final. OK, uh, if you have any questions about that, just feel free to message me or send me an email or you could, like I said, just call the main office at MacArthur directly. OK, uh, so we're going to get right into this. There's a lot to get through on this. Hopefully the video won't get too long. Um, I'm going to end up answering these questions. I'm just going to cover this with some spare paper. Uh, just to kind of expand out, I kept the questions kind of tightly packed on the ditto so you didn't have too much to print out for those of you that do print out the sheets. Uh, but I'm going to do the answers out on separate paper uh, for a portion of them. Other ones I'll do right on the ditto itself. Okay. Um, so we start off, here's an exponentials functions question. So if you remember, this is compound interest. So we have uh, this formula that we'd be using uh, where this is your final amount. This is your initial amount. This is the nominal percent rate that they tell you you're going to get. This is the number of times it's being compounded. It goes in two spots in the exponent and in that divisor. And this is the total amount of time frame that you're going to be leaving that investment in for. So uh, they give us all of that information in the question. They're asking how long will it take for $2,000 to reach $2,800? So if we set that equation up, we have a final amount. We have an initial amount. And we have a nominal percent rate of 6%. They show you write all percentages as decimals. And divided by the number of compoundings, quarterly is four times per year. And how long will that take? Now, if this were a multiple choice style question, um, you know, where you didn't have to display your work, uh, obviously, if it's a free response on the final and, you, and it asks you to solve it algebraically, you'd have to have the appropriate algebra work uh, accompanying the answer. So you wouldn't really be able to do it graphically. But if it's a multiple choice question, something like this, you would just be able to plug this into Y1 and plug all of this into Y2. And essentially, you would see a graph. Here's your initial value at 2,000, and it's growing at 6% quarterly. And here would be your second equation, Y2, of 2,800. And you would put that in, and that would go across and intersect somewhere. That intersection would be the answer to how long it would take. So this would be your Y1. That would be this. This would be your Y2, the horizontal constant. You just find the intersection, second trace intersect. Uh, not too tough algebra uh, graphically. So uh, let's go through this algebraically. And uh, to do that, what I would recommend is using the effective annual yield, which is another separate question that they can ask you about. Hey, if you earn 6% compound quarterly, what's the effective annual yield that you get? Well, to do that, it's easiest if you just calculate what the equivalent of that overall B value would be. So you see how this is like A, B to the X. So that B is the effective annual yield. So if you work that out on a calculator, including the compounded exponent, that four, uh, you're going to get a number 1.06136321. One. I know that's a lot of digits that I wrote out. Um, and then don't forget, when we start, we're going to be dividing the coefficients to the other side. So we have the constants on one side, so it's going to be 1.4, and the base and the exponential on the other side. All right, so that's essentially what we have. That's a much simpler um, term or expression to solve for. So what we're going to do next is we're going to put in the logs on both sides. So um, I tend to use natural logs most often, right? And then that will take the exponent and place it out in front according to the... Um, rules of logs. You can use any log base you like, the common log, LOG, base 10 log, log base 2, log base 3. You want to keep it simple. The uh, calculator faceplate has two simple logs, the common log, LOG, and then the LN. 
Um, there's no advantage to either one necessarily here. I tend to use LNs more often uh, because there's more times when you'll have an E in your expression. Uh, it's very rare you'll see an exact base 10 number in your equations. So I tend not to use the common laws. So when we rewrite this, we get the LN of 1.4 and that's equal to T times the LN of 1.06136 with a lot of other decimals. And we're going to divide that by this LN, so 1.06136 with some more decimals. That cancels, and we'll divide it over to here, so 1.06136 with some more decimals. So when you divide that out on your calculator, you'll get T is equal to um, approximately like 5.6498 years. Okay. Now, this question didn't say what to round to. On your final exam, it'll be clear about what you should be rounding your final answers to. Uh, in part B, so let's number this one. There's one A. Here's one B. It's going to be the same situation, but instead of being compounded, uh, notice it says up here quarterly, this one is going to be compounded daily. So it's going to be almost the identical question. Uh, it's just the number of compoundings is going to be different. So when we write this out, we follow the same formula. It's going to be a final amount of 2,800, oops, sorry, 2,800, and that's going to equal 2,000 times 1 plus still 6%, but this time it's going to be divided up every day. So we'll have a 365 in the end number, not a 4. All right, so notice it's pretty similar to the first question. But again, we want to come up with one number right here. So let me highlight this. It's much easier to calculate one decimal number out of that. And we're going to still divide this 2,000 over to the other side. Okay, so we get 1.4 equals, and now we're going to write out what that decimal number is. This is approximately 1.06183131. Okay, and all of that is to your T value, right? So this is all to the T. All right, so we're going to do the same thing we just did before. We're going to take the ln of both sides or any log base, right? And that's going to bring our exponent out in front. And so when we do that, we get the ln of 1.4 is equal to t times the ln of 1.06183 with some more decimals. And now we just have to divide that out. So 1.6183 with more decimals, and we get rid of it and the ln of 1.06183 with some more decimals. So in this case, you get t, and we'll uh, use our calculator so we can see what that value comes out to be. So we'll compare. Let me put that up here for you, uh, where you can see it, I guess. There we go. Um, so let me just move this up a little bit. There we go. That's a little bit better. It's a little brighter. Uh, so we get... I like to use the fraction mode so I don't screw up any uh, syntax typing on these, right? So I have the ln of 1.4, and it's going to be divided by the ln of 1.06183131. I just wrote out all the digits there. And that's 5.60833 years. So 5.60833 years approximately, right? So it's rounded, obviously, a little bit. You'll notice that it takes a little bit less time, right? Fractions of a year, right? Decimals of it. Uh, so hundredths of a year difference. This is 5.65 almost. This is 5.60. So it's like five hundredths of a year faster. Uh, if we go to 1C, let's go down to here. Just drop this again. Uh, again, on the top, if you look, Right, so this one's a whole different question. It says you're going to get five and three quarters percent, but this time it's going to be continuously. So now, how long would it take two thousand dollars to grow into twenty eight hundred dollars? So let's go back up to this and we'll set up some space here. So first thing we need to know is what's this five and three quarters percent? That's like five point seven five percent, five and three quarters percent. So when we write that as our decimal, it's point oh five seven five. So that's one thing we're going to need to know. That's your R value, that nominal percent rate. The other thing we need to know is it's a continuous growth rate question. So it's going to be that. And since it's five and three quarters percent continuously, that continuous growth rate is that K value. Okay. So we're going to write that out as 2,800 is where it has to end up equaling. It's going to start out equaling 2,000 with the initial investment and E to the positive 0.0575 T. 
And we're going to solve this equation out just like we did all the others. So again, now the first step is let's divide this 2000 over. We'll get rid of that. So we get that same constant 1.4. This time it's equal to E to the 0.0575T. All right, so now we're going to do the same things. Definitely makes a lot of sense to take the LN on this because we have a base E. So we get that out in front. So we have the LN of 1.4 is equal to 0.0575T times the LN of E. And because we have the LN of E, that's just equal to 1. That's why it cancels out. So now we just have a coefficient of 0.0575 that we can divide over to the other side. So if we divide that over, we get our T value that's approximately, and again, we're just going to take the calculator and see if I can find a spot where you can see that. So alpha fraction, and we're going to do ln of 1.4 divided by uh, 0.0575, and we get an answer of about 5.85 years, roughly. So this answer, 5.85 years. Okay, so it actually took longer, but that's because the percent rate was less. So the percent rate really has the more dominant effect on those equations, okay? All right, so we go on to question number two. This is like just a bunch of different equation solving questions. So the first one is actually very similar to what we've been doing already. So let's uh, set up the paper here. So we have uh, question number 2a. Can we solve 4 times 1.34 to the t, and that's equal to 2 to the t? So remember when we're doing these, you want to get the bases on one side and the constant coefficients on the other side, right? So... Uh, I could divide this base of 1.34 to the t over. So if I do that, 1.34 to the t, I cancel this. Let's divide this by 1.34 to the t. So right now I've got 4 on this side, and it's equal to this. Now you can rewrite this as just one base, 2 divided by 1.34 all to the t, because they have the same exponent at that point. So we've talked about how to split those exponents up into you know, factors if you need to. We did that on a previous example in chapter one, uh, four or five review. Um, so whatever you might need to do in that case, this one's kind of already set up for it. So now we can just put in a log on both sides and then that's gonna take the exponent out in front. So right now we will have the ln of four is equal to t times the ln of two divided by 1.34. Now you can work out that decimal if you want. It's an ongoing decimal, you'll see. Uh, it's like 1.4925 with a lot of the other digits. So you can make that one number if it's easier for you. If we divide this over, uh, we'll divide by that log and divide by this log. And so that cancels out. So our T value exactly is that number, okay? Uh, that number approximately, you could work it out. Um, you don't need to because the directions in this question say uh, show the answer in an exact form. So this would be an equivalent exact form. Okay. You could also have that expanded if you need to. Um, you know, uh, this could be log of two minus log of one point three four and so on. Okay. So um, that would be the final answer in the case right there for two A. In two uh, B, if we go down to here. This one's a trig question, right? It's a quadratic trig equation. We've got cosine squared with sine functions. So let me write that one over. Uh, this is 2b. 2 cosine squared theta, and it's equal to sine of theta plus 1. So here's our equation. All right, so first things first that we notice, you're going to see that we have a cosine squared, but with a sine function. So that we're not going to be able to, that's like having X's and Y's in there. So what we're going to need to do is find a replacement for cosine squared. Remember, Pythagorean identities, cosine squared is the same as 1 minus sine squared. So what we get as a result, when we distribute that, now we have the entire function in terms of sines. So if we distribute this, we get 2 minus 2 sine squared theta equals sine of theta plus 1. So I'm going to set this equal to zero. Because this is a negative coefficient with my x squared term, I'm going to add that to the right side and make it positive. It's easier to factor and solve and do things like that that way. So I'm going to subtract a 2, and I'm going to add a 2 sine squared over to this side. All right, so that's gone and that's gone. We get 0 equals 2 sine squared theta plus a sine theta, and then this turns out to be minus 1. All right, so here's where we're at. 
you need to either use the quadratic formula if you're not comfortable factoring this, or just factor that up if you're comfortable factoring this. This is 2 sine theta times sine theta, and it's going to multiply to 1, so it's going to be a plus 1 and a minus 1. So all of that is equal to the zeros. There's our two roots. We're going to get this root. 2 sine of theta minus 1 equals 0. If I add 1 and divide by 2, I get sine of theta is equal to 1 half. Over here, I get sine of theta plus 1 equals 0. I'm going to get sine of theta equals negative 1. So those are my two root values. i got to get theta from those values. So here's where trig drills come into play. So uh, from, by the way, if you weren't good at factoring this or didn't want to factor it, just use the quadratic formula with the coefficients a is 2, b is 1, and c is negative 1. You'll still come out to the 1 half and the negative 1 from the quadratic formula. So you could do that too if that's easier for you. So uh, remember we know here theta ref, this is going to be pi over 6. Uh, sine theta equal negative 1, that's going to happen at a quadrantal angle. That's right there. So this is 3 pi over 2. Right, so this answer is going to be theta is equal to 3 pi over 2. We need to get the reference angle here, and because, remember, all students take calculus, uh, it's a positive half in the first and second quadrants. So quadrant 1, pi over 6 is the final answer, but in quadrant 2, right, we're going to do pi minus pi over 6. So that's like 6 over 6 minus 1 over 6, that's going to be 5 pi over 6. So you've got one, two, and three answers for those solutions. Okay. Uh, moving on to number two, C. Uh, that's over here, if you can see at the top of the page. So let me move over here. Uh, 2C is a log equation, right? So number 2C, we've got ln of x minus 3 plus ln of x minus 2, and that's equal to ln of 2. So we're going to need to combine that because you can't do e to the e to the e to the. That doesn't work. So we got to combine this into a single log expression. So the ln of, the sum turns into uh, product. So x minus 3 times x minus 2. And then that's going to equal the ln of 2. So we can expand that out. This is the ln of x squared minus 5x plus 6. And that's going to equal the ln of 2. So now we want to eliminate the logs, use the inverse of the log function, which is the base of the log, so it's a base e there. So these will cancel. And then we're left with x squared minus 5x plus 6 is equal to 2. All right, so now we have to figure out uh, how that's going to work out and um, all of this. Let's see. So we've got minus 2 to both sides, x squared minus 5x plus 4 is equal to 0. So what multiplies to 4 adds up to negative 5? Oh, that does factor. This is going to be an x minus 4 times x minus 1 equals 0. So we get a t-chart set of answers. x can be 4 or x can be 1. Just remember, we have to go back and check. If I plug a 4 in for x, 4 minus 3 is 1 you can take the log of 1. 4 minus 2 is 2. You can take the log of 2. The log of any positive number is uh, sufficient. It's, it's a, a real number. But if you plug 1 in for x, 1 minus 3 is negative 2. You can't take the log of a negative number. It doesn't exist. Remember, the domain for logs, if you remember log functions, they look like this. So it's only positive values. So you can't have the input of a log function be negative. So this answer we would have to reject. So it's only going to be L, uh, x equals 4 for that solution, okay? And these are also done graphically, too. If you want to graph this out, you could put this into y1, and you could put this into y2, hit like a zoom standard type window, and you'll be able to see the intersection at x equals 4. So you can do it graphically as well for these, okay? Uh, if you want to go back to 2b, here was your original uh, equation, right? And then we made the substitutions. We got down to here. You could type this into y1 and put 0 into y2, and then hit zoom trig, which is zoom number seven, and you'll be able to see the three intersections at those three spots. If you do it in degree mode, you'll be able to make more sense out of the answers you get from the intersections. In degree mode, this will say 30, this will say 150, and this will say 270. Uh, you might recognize that rather than the decimals you would get from these radian measurement answers, okay? All right, brings us up to number three. And for number three, <clears throat> that is uh, another exponentials question, right? So. This one's saying um, 
what happens based on this formula, uh, how long would it take for this uh, sample to be reduced by 90%? So if it's reduced by 90%, it means there's only 10% remaining. So if there's only 10% remaining, remember you can set up 10% equals uh, the base to the exponent. So this is e to that negative 0. 0.00012, 0.00012 with the t value. So if you remember, the reason why it's uh, the initial value and the final value are gone is because when you first start this out, you're dividing over the initial amount. So you're getting this final amount divided by initial amount, but that's going to come out to be 10%. They're saying that the, since 90% has uh, decreased, there's only 10% left. So it's always the percent remaining equals b to the t. And that b in this case comes from the uh, natural exponent, e to the k. All right, so we're going to solve this out. At this point, it's already set. All we got to do is take the ln of both sides. So that's going to bring this out in front. And so what we're left with is the ln of 0.10 is equal to negative 0.00012t times the ln of e. And you might remember again, so this before, the ln of e just cancels out, it's one. So we can divide by the coefficient, and get rid of that, and divide by the coefficient. And so our t value is gonna come out to be approximately uh, 19,188, and then there's like 0 0.209 years. And again, all the questions on the final will say what to round to. So you won't have to worry about, you know, how much should you go for decimal values, okay? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this one actually said it. So it says rounded to the nearest year. So your answer in this case would just be 19,188 years, okay? So this one actually did say it. Um, now we go down to number four. This one I'll do on the paper itself, right? So um, find the formula for this parabola and notice where the vertex is. The vertex is at negative two comma negative two. So we can use the general formula, x minus h squared plus k. The h is negative two, the k is negative two also. So this is gonna start out a times x minus negative two. So that's just x plus two squared. Remember the parentheses always changes the sign, right? And then this is gonna be minus two. So now I want to substitute another coordinate. Here we have a coordinate right here of two comma two. We can plug this in for your x and plug this in for your y. That will replace these values and then it will allow me to solve for a. So when I do that, I get uh, two is equal to a times two plus two. That's four squared minus two. So let's add this two over and we get four is equal to a times four squared, which is 16. So if we divide by 16, you get your a value to be one fourth. So this is gonna turn out to be one fourth, face up, positive, makes sense, and then x oops, plus two squared minus two. So there's your final equation in that one. Uh, find the average rate of change, right? So average rate of change, remember, that's between x equals negative two to positive two. So when x is negative two, I'm right here. When x is positive two, I'm right there. The rate of change is the slope that is right there. So here's your slope of that. That's your rate of change. So when we're solving that out, you can use the slope formula. We have two coordinates here. We have a coordinate at negative two, negative two. And we have another coordinate at positive two, positive two. So here's like your x1, y1, here's your x2, y2. So if we use our um, you know, slope formula, uh, y2 minus y1, two minus negative two, that's four. So over two minus negative two, that's four. Oh, so this slope is just one. And you can check it, it goes up one over one, up one over one, up one over one, up one over one. So the slope is definitely one, okay? Is the function invertible well, in this case, the function is clearly not invertible. And the reason is because it fails the horizontal line test at numerous spots everywhere except at the vertex. So this is not an invertible function. And the reason is, is because it fails the horizontal line test. That's to tell if the inverse is a function. Vertical line test will tell you if something is a function. Horizontal line test will tell you if the inverse of that thing is a function. 
Okay, so this this thing fails. Now there is a spot, however, if I highlight a certain spot over here, where it is invertible. So from here all the way out, from that part, it is invertible. Right? If we only inverted a portion of the graph, right? That does pass the horizontal line test. So where is the y value negative one? That's the inverse. So this answer is going to come out to be the x value when that happens. Where is it negative one? There it is right there. When x is zero, the y value is negative one. So when x is zero, that's the answer to f inverse of one, negative one. Even though the function itself is not invertible, for a restricted domain, it would be invertible. And then this would exist. This does not exist for the entire function. Okay. All right, on to the back page. This is chapter 11 stuff. So we go back up to here. Um, so these are some things that we've seen um, now recently, hopefully. So uh, we'll see. Hopefully these will remind you of some of the things we've been doing. Um, so it's asking us to identify all these pieces about this function. All right, so um, remember, it's helpful to look at this in factored form. If you take out the two, you're left with x squared minus nine. So you can break that down into x plus 3, x minus 3. So you've got those sets of factors. And then this one breaks down into x minus 4 and x plus 2. So the first thing you might notice is, are there any holes? So are any of these factors um, the same factors, top and bottom, that can cancel out? You'll have a point of removal of discontinuity. But since there isn't, there are no holes. Okay? So this does not apply, not applicable. Okay? So there are none, all right? Um, I guess you'd write none instead of NA. All right, so now that we got that out of the way, we don't have to worry about any holes. So we're gonna have all the rest of these things, right? So if we go in order, um, let's start building our graph so that we can sketch this. So if you remember, um, we've been talking about vertical asymptotes. I think I've been doing those in orange all the way along. Uh, oops, sorry, vertical asymptotes there. So the vertical asymptotes come from the factors of the bottom, okay? So in this case, we're going to have uh, x equals 4 and x equals negative 2. So here's 4. You can draw a line right here in orange. And x equals negative 2. That's going to be another vertical asymptote all the way over here. Okay, so there's our vertical asymptotes. We got that out. Uh, the next one, the horizontal asymptote, sorry, that's in blue. Let me go over that. Blue. All right, so the horizontal asymptote's easiest to see from the leading term. So you're going to go back into the standard form. So in this case, uh, we would have y equals uh, 2x squared over x squared. So since they cancel, that means y equals 2 is going to be our horizontal asymptote. So here's y equals 2, and I'll do the... Uh, horizontal asymptote going straight across. Remember, that's for the long run behavior for this graph. Um, then we go to the x-intercepts. And for x-intercepts, you might remember we were using uh, green. So those are the factors of the top. So factored form is easier to use. Uh, and then for this one, it's going to be x equals negative 3 and x equals positive 3. So what that means is negative 3 comma 0 and 3 comma 0. So Here's four, so positive three and negative three, which is on the other side of the asymptote. Those are your two x-intercepts. Okay, then we go to the y-intercept, and we've been using pink for those, I believe. So the y-intercept, we've got the constants on the end. So that's going to be negative 18 over 8. So this would be y equals negative 18 over, sorry, negative 8. So that turns out to be 9 fourths if you reduce. So that's like 0 comma 9 fourths. That's like 2 and a quarter. So it's just above the horizontal asymptote. It's like right there, 2 and a little bit. All right, so we've got our picture. Okay, now we're just going to draw this thing appropriately. So you can use your calculator to graph out the standard form if you like. It might be easier that way. I see that I've got my x-intercept here, and it's got a curl towards the asymptote on the left and curl towards the asymptote going down. Uh, I know that there's no x-intercepts over here, so the graph is going to be on this side of the asymptotes up there. And then I know that the graph is going to go through the y-intercept and the x-intercept and then travel down asymptotically on that side and travel up asymptotically on that side. So if you draw that picture out, you should see something that looks similar to that on your graph. Okay? All right, number six, final question. 
All right, so let's see. Can you determine what type of table this would be, whether it be linear, exponential, power function, all those different types, quadratic, trigonometric, right? Is it cyclic? So if you look at the, uh, notice the in input intervals are consistent. They go up by one. So that makes it easy. All we have to do is check the outputs. Uh, if the consecutive differences were the same, this goes uh, down by 1,000, down by 500, down by 250. That's not obviously the same. So it's not linear. It's not constant. Um, is it exponential? So if it were exponential, the ratios of consecutive outputs would have to be the same. So is 1,000 compared to 2,000 the same as 500 compared to 1,000, which is the same as 250 to 500? And the answer is yes, they're all one half. So this is like your B value that you get. That's that uh, common ratio, if you will, right? So we know the B value. Um, so, and we also know that it must be exponential, right? And so uh, how do we know that, determining it? Well, uh, y2 compared to y1 is a common ratio, okay? It's the same all the way through. So that means you have that common multiplier, that b value, that's equal to that b value from your y equals a b to the x, okay? That's that number we're multiplying by every time. So let's find a formula for this thing. Well, we know our b value is going to be a half. We just need the a value, right? So this is the uh, y-intercept, right? Well, we actually have that when you look at it. Here's your y-intercept, okay? So since that is given, we know that the y-intercept happens to be 2,000. So we can write our equation, y equals 2,000 times one half to the x. And there's your function. If you graph that out, you'll get the same table of values. Okay? All right, I hope that helped. We're going to do, uh, you know, a couple more sets of cumulative review exercises. I know this hit on a few different sets of topics. Uh, and I know in the Zoom, uh, we hit on uh, limits and optimization questions. So hopefully you had a chance to check the answer keys there. Um, so let me know, you know, over the next couple of days, shoot me a message if anything doesn't make sense or if you're getting stuck somewhere, and hopefully I'll be able to clarify it. And then next week, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, will be the final exam, and then we'll be done. That's the last of it. All right. If you have any other outstanding grades, just make sure you check Power School. And if you have any uh, missing assignments that don't have grades listed for them, uh, just make sure that you go back and you, you know, update them because you do get a numerical fourth quarter grade. Uh, for this quarter. It's going to be based on your Y1 grade and hopefully improved on by a few points based on your zero to four uh, overall um, fourth quarter readout. So you don't get a, you know, the fourth quarter grade will be the grade that is compared to your Y1 and then increased based on your uh, remote learning engagement. So if you got a four across the board for your assignments for the fourth quarter, you'll get a plus two points on your Y1 average as your fourth quarter grade. So you can only go up. That'll help. Okay. Again, if you have any questions, just let me know and uh, feel free to message me. All right. Thanks a lot. See you soon.